All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sean Sullivan, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA's high flow differential cleaning technology. Our presenter today is Mark Mitchell. Following Mark's presentation on the technologies, I'll give a brief presentation on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. But before we get started, I did want to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this entire presentation. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box. There's a Q&A box right in the bottom right of your screen, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end. So first, I want to introduce our presenter, Mark Mitchell. Mark holds both a Bachelor of Science in Physics and in Chemistry. In his 32-year career, Mark has held multiple positions, including the Assistant Chief Engineer for the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer and International Space Station Payload Integration Manager. He is currently a systems engineer and a subject matter expert in the areas of solvent cleaning and testing, foreign object, object debris, and contamination control. Mark has received numerous awards, the NAR NASA Marshall Innovation Team Award, the NASA Systems Engineering Technical Excellence Award, and the MSFC Materials and Processes Laboratory Collaborator Award, just to name a few. He currently lives with his wife of 32 years in Decatur, Alabama, and has two daughters, one son, two sons-in-law, and two grandchildren. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. All right. Well, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to share this information today with uh, a group of people that uh, may be interested in a in, uh, new method for cleaning additive manufactured parts. Um, NASA has been working with additive manufacturing for many years now, uh, but in the last, uh, say, five years, it's really uh, become uh, a, a type of production of parts that, that's moved to the forefront, and uh, they're looking at doing uh, all kinds of uh, additive manufacturing, not only here on Earth, but in space. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, I figure most everybody is familiar with, with uh, selective laser melting and, and the additive manufacturing processes, but basically in, in uh, powder bed fusion, uh, additive manufacturing layers of material deposited and, and selectively fused um, to form a three-dimensional part. Uh, once the material, once it's completed, the, the remnant material, the powder, uh, has to be removed prior to the post-production processes. Sometimes this is very difficult if uh, the component is uh, complex, has, has many intricate cavities that, that uh, can trap uh, remnant bulk powder, et cetera. So, so we've, uh, we were having a lot of problems with specific components that we were trying to uh, manufacture using the additive manufacturing process. Um, the, the attractive characteristics of additive manufacturing is it, it, it allows you to build very complex parts in a single step process that's not labor intensive. You basically want to in, incorporate the CAD uh, image and the CAD program into the, uh, com the equipment, you, you end up with a piece of uh, a component that is manufactured according to the, the you know, the CAD drawing. So um, these complex parts, though, uh, when they do entrap uh, the uh, powder w inside the parts, it, it becomes very difficult to, to remove that, especially if you go to some of the uh, follow-on techniques to remove from the, the plate or um, uh, to uh, like uh, thermally uh, affect the part by doing some sort of uh, vacuum uh, heating and, and uh, that sort of thing. So one of the complex parts that we built um, that specifically we started working with um, Prior to added manufacturing process, there was 105 production sequence steps to building the part, whether it be um, welding, 
together smaller components to to build a bigger part or um, bolting them together, that sort of thing. So so one part manufactured and added manufactured, you know, in a in a AM uh, piece of equipment uh, replaced 105 labor intensive steps. Um, so what we what we ended up thinking and kind of brainstorming and came up with a concept of um, how can we clean this powder out without uh, spending all the additional time um, that was needed. Uh, on, the, on, the, on this chart, you can see um, one, of the, one of the fellows there, he's actually using a rubber mallet to, to knock powder out of a component uh, that was built and the plate is you know facing up the part is actually face down on the table he's trying to knock the powder out of it um, then on the, on the right picture he's he's blowing the part off with uh, compressed air uh, vacuuming is also a method that has been used for trying to remove powder but when you have complex cavities within a part it's very difficult to remove that powder using these techniques and it's very labor intensive and can take a lot of time uh, so well we we were trying to come up with a method that might uh, eliminate those steps and uh, our biggest thought process was well, what if we had some sort of way of, of forcing air through a part forcing it uh, such that it um, would blast the powder out of the part and so um, we searched around uh, Redstone Arsenal and Marshall Space Flight Center looking for a piece of equipment that we might could mount a part into and we were unsuccessful then uh, we uh, around North Alabama there is a, a fall festival that takes place out at Tate Farms and they have a pumpkin shooter out there and so we contacted um, the people out there at Tate Farms and asked them if we could uh, mount a part in their pumpkin cannon and uh, try to uh, see if, if this technology would at least be successful um, or somewhat successful. We didn't have any idea if it would work or not, but we wanted to give it a shot. So we built a jig and mounted the part on that. And you can see that in the right picture there, uh, the, the top picture. And uh, then uh, we closed the chamber and, and it was a, it's basically a 500 gallon propane tank that, that was just uh, filled with air. Um, the operating pressure that we tested at was 40 PSI. And uh, just so you know, 40 PSI, uh, and this pumpkin shooter will launch a, pump, a pumpkin for about three quarters of a mile at a velocity of 600 miles per hour. So that's, uh, that's pretty crazy. But um, when, we, when we tested the part, we actually ran some CT scans before and CT scans after and uh, found that this uh, process seemed to, to work uh, pretty well. So we wanted to then come up with a, a way of building a piece of equipment that would be um, better than, you know, using a pumpkin cannon. So, um, so the, the proposal was uh, some of the improvements that we wanted to do. We wanted to, uh, of course, eliminate the manual process for removing bulk powder directly from the AM part. Um, the manual process, such as, you know, the percussive using a rubber mallet, um, blowing with uh, uh, shop air or uh, a missile grade air type um, hose or vacuuming with a shop vac or some sort of vacuum system. Those were the types of systems we were using before. And we had a shaker table and all kinds of different ways that we were trying to remove this powder. but. Um, it was it was very time consuming and, and it was not very successful either. So, um, so we wanted to do this. Uh, we wanted to eliminate the water condensation 
that occurs by using blowing just blowing with air um, by using uh, either purified nitrogen or uh, purified dry air a missile grade air system which we have available to us so that's what we we currently use is a uh, missile grade air um, so we want to modify the text fixture to enable easy orientation and adjustments so that you can you can orient the part inside the test chamber and different ways in order to be successful at uh, affecting every orifice that uh, is uh, on the part. Um, then we also wanted to add capability to implement plugs on the test articles in order to block off different outlet paths for focus cleaning of internal passageways and uh, the implementation of downstream extensions on the component to eliminate pressure drops thereby you know you're depositing the powder further away from the, the actual uh, piece of uh, uh, the component that we're trying to clean so we want to try to get the powder uh, to blast as far away from the component as possible so um, these Next few charts are just some uh, graphical pictures of some of the components of the equipment. So this shows the high pressure pipe in the test chamber. Um, the there is a I, I won't go into a lot of details because the bottom line is this equipment can be sized to clean uh, whatever size part you want to clean. So if you you need to clean a car. You could build a test chamber that's um, that will house a car, and as long as you have a large enough uh, volume of air that you can force through the the car, um, you can you can basically build any size equipment you want. Um, the uh, the Y pipe that is shown there is another capability that I think would be beneficial if you have a very difficult part to clean by alternating. Um, so you have like a blast from, from one side and then uh, a blast, you know, it, it uh, comes back to ambient pressure and then a blast from the other, you know, and, and you're basically cycling back and forth. That gives you the ability to, to cycle where uh, as, Currently configured, we only have one uh, air tank that we're uh, we're uh, using, and so we're only doing a single blast through a part. And then we w might go in and reorient the part and do another blast and that sort of thing. But if you if you do this, uh, you could do it uh, robotically by actually manipulating uh, the part inside using a, a mechanical turntable or something like that if you needed to um, in order to uh, keep, keep from having to open the, the chamber door and do all this you could do it all remotely from outside if you wanted to um, so this again is just a, a picture of uh, the blast plate it's shown from upstream and then also shown from downstream uh, inside the the chamber so um, the blast plate just uh, gives it ensures that the test chamber will not exceed a 10 psi pressure differential from upstream and downstream so we, we want to be able to uh, this particular piece of equipment was, was designed for for a safety standpoint to uh, protect the the part so you're not going to um, damage anything uh, through the the process this also gives you a, a, a view of the blast plate in the chamber uh, with the door removed there and then you also have the, the butterfly valves that are shown um, they're on the right side. So I'm going to show a quick video, and you may have seen uh, this early on. I'm going to kind of talk through it as we go. Um, 
you can see Bill is, is actually uh, inside the chamber here, uh, mounting a part. The, the difficulty with research and development testing is, you know, you, you have one-off pieces, you have uh, nothing, uh, you can't build a production type system. So, so there's not a jig in there that you, you can just like slide a part into and clamp it down, which is what, you know, I would do if I'm, if I'm working with something like this equipment in a production atmosphere, I would, I would build a jig that would mount the part that I need to be cleaned if it's a repetitive type part. Um, mount it in there quickly, clamp it down, uh, shut the chamber door, and, and then run the process. And you can see the process is pretty quick. So I'm, I'm going to turn the video on now and let you take a look, and, and I'll talk through what we're doing. So. so that guy on the right, that's me. And this is Bill. He's actually strapping a part down onto the the plate that uh, is used to hold the part and then uh, the blast chamber is upstream and, and you can see this this is the entirety of the test right there it it, it uh, forces air through the part and that um, fog that you see is just condensation of the ambient air as uh, so much of the air is being forced through the part and the pressure change causes uh, causes condensation. So um, I'll run through this quickly one more time. Um, so mounting of the part, again, this, this part, um, we built this chamber to basically sized it to fit any part that our largest added manufacturing piece of equipment could build at the time. That has since changed and we have larger equipment now, uh, but, but we built it so that we could use it in our uh, production if we needed to clean any part that was being built at that time. Um, so the uh, but again, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that the equipment, the concept of the equipment could be sized to, to uh, basically clean any size component that is needed. So let's see. The uh, next chart show the initial test part that we, that we, we use for testing in the equipment. Um, the picture here on the, the left side is a, a cutaway drawing of uh, the test component that we used. It had several openings and, and, and intricate passageways internal, and uh, we wanted that. It, it, it's not an exact part that is, is flown, but it is similar in the uh, types of um, openings and cavities that are, are noted in some of the components that we we try to build using uh, the added manufacturing process for our rocket engines and the reason that it's so important to remove all the the uh, powder is uh any particle um can uh, in a in a hydrogen and oxygen um atmosphere uh, if it causes a spark, it could it could be catastrophic in in our uh, flight. So we want to ensure that all the components are are 100% clean. Uh, you may work for an industry where the the cleaning process is not as stringent as it is for us. And that being the case, this gross powder removal method that we're talking about might be all you need, but. Uh, once once we do this gross powder cleaning process for using a high flow differential system, then you know our parts would would be further cleaned using um, either the solvent cleaning, uh, you know, uh, uh, aqueous based cleaning, et cetera, that sort of thing. So we want to ensure that there's no residues, no particles uh, that could cause a problem. So, but these levels that you see marked over here on the left side. Or, uh, 
This is the kind of ways that you'll see in some of the following part, uh, showing where particles are noted when they, they did the CT scans. Um, if you can see my arrow and the blue arrows are pointing to, uh, that's, that's actually powder inside the part that was uh, uh, residual after the additive manufacturing process. The right side then shows the part cleaned and after the HFD process, and you, you see that those those areas uh, are clean. So the thing we, we actually built four identical parts um, and cleaned using this prototype method. Uh, it effectively removed uh, a lot. Of, well, in many cases, all of the powder. Uh, and so then we also doped uh, a couple of the parts with additional powder and and with uh, some fluorescent powder just to see um, we did the fluorescent so we wouldn't have to use the CT process every time because that was time consuming. We could just uh, do a fluorescent, uh, use a black light and, and see if we removed powder from internal uh, to the, the part. So anyway, following CT analysis of the first parts where, where uh, there was a small patch of remnant powder found, uh, we, we did the doping of, of two other components. So, and you can see that there was crap powder shown and then the clean component, you can see that the powders, the entrapped powder was removed Again, um, this is another cutaway of that same part. Shows entrapped powder that was deposited um, in a different area there. And then afterward, the, the powder was removed. So, the uh, Analysis that was done was, was uh, of course, CT scanning where it was cut away. Uh, we didn't actually cut the part um, in all cases. In some cases, we did just to verify that that the, all the all the remnant powder was removed. But um, the observed powder here at elevation 125, you can see the arrows are pointing here, and the clean component shows the powder was removed. Here again, you see a magnified version of the uh, left picture. And then here, uh, powder was removed there as well. So um, the process seems to do a, a, a very good job in uh, most cases. Um, there's uh, uh, this part you can see there was trap powder observed at elevation 1A. Um, and then the clean component there was still a little water present after cleaning on here. And uh, we did uh, do wire EDM and cut this part open to see if that was a, a, a defect in the part or if it was actually powder. And after, after cutting with the wire EDM process, um, it was gone. So uh, it, it was either some loosely adhered particles that were uh, on the wall there that after the EDM process, it, it uh, might have loosened during the HFD process and then um, removed during the, the, the EDM process, which is, uh, you know, there's a water washing across a, a wire that cuts through the components. So here's another uh, part, uh, just a different cutaway of the same basic part, uh, but it's the, the part number three. Um, powder was observed at the main cavity sidewall up at the top upper corner. And after the cleaning, the powder was removed. Uh, and again, uh, this was part number four. This was doped part. Um, you can see powder in these passageways 
here. And uh, these are not openings that, uh, these are small openings that uh, the powder was entrapped into. It's basically a, a very tiny tube that uh, opens from this cavity to this cavity and causes the the flow to become uh, tornadic or uh, so anyway if those are blocked um, then you wouldn't get the proper um, flow out of this component and if your uh, your powder was to break free then it could be uh, catastrophic as I said earlier So that's the bulk of the, the uh, presentation that I have. Um, I wanted to give a few acknowledgments, uh, particularly to Tate Farms for allowing us to, to do our beta test there. Uh, then of course the material test chemistry and contamination control branch uh, and those guys were all instrumental in, in helping with uh, building this part and uh, designing this part and, and brainstorming to come up with a method and then of course you saw in the video you saw Bill Battle doing a lot of the the mounting of the test parts and that sort of thing so uh, many thanks to those guys uh, of course added manufacturing group at Marshall uh, mechanical materials and structures uh, doing the CT scans and the reports for that uh, then we have mechanical fab uh, building some test fixtures for us. Uh, the CAD design was done by uh, our test group at, at Marshall. And then, of course, I especially want to thank Tech Transfer folks, uh, John and uh, Jordan and Daniel Cunningham and Sean Sullivan, who's hosting this uh, webinar. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sean. Well, great. Thank you, Mark, so much for answering the questions today. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, that is all the time that we have for our questions today. But again, I know I've mentioned this a few times. If we didn't get to your question or your questions during the Q&A session, then we will follow up with you by email within the next week or so. Uh, if you have additional questions, please feel free to submit them to that email address uh, for the agency uh, licensing concierge. You can also submit questions uh, on that web page that's, that's uh, displayed on the screen right now. Um, and once again, you know, we really appreciate you all being here today and uh, hopefully we'll see you at an upcoming virtual event. Have a great day, everyone.